Hello, everybody, and welcome to this session on mHealth. My name is Ludmio Ninov, and I'll be the moderator of your session today, together with uh, my colleague um, Hannes Jarke. We'll be talking about the role of uh, mHealth and digital therapeutics to improve patients' control of their healthcare. Um, before we start, I would like you to go to the poll section uh, at the right corner of uh, the website, uh, Swapcard, and answer this very um, important but also simple question. Have you ever been regularly using an mHealth application? You can uh, answer uh, in the poll section while I will be gladly present our amazing panel today. Um, and it consists of uh, three speakers. The first one is uh, Petra Hohendorn. She is an experienced patient advocate and uh, initiator of two M Health apps uh, in oncology, um, but also does research at the National e Health Living Lab at Leiden University Medical Center. Uh, um, as you can see, as with our previous speakers, she's wearing several hats. Then we have uh, Antanas Montvila, who's uh, a radiologist working in a hospital of Lithuanian University of Health Science, Calvas Clinics, but also he's wearing the hat of a vice president in the European Junior Doctors Association, uh, where he's coordinating a digital health working group. And finally, last but not least, we have Angel Martin, who's a senior director of digital health health and taxation advocacy for Johnson & Johnson, but also, again, he's wearing another hat, and this one is chair of MedTech Europe's Digital Health Committee on uh, inter uh, Artificial Intelligence and uh, a Data Working Group, and also a vice chair of Digital Health, um, Digital Europe, um, Digital Health Working Group. Uh, it's a mouthful, but uh, it's absolutely a pleasure to um, welcome uh, our three speakers. And I hope that everybody is um, answering on the polls. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, um, I'm also going to do it. So, um, uh, so far, I see that uh, th that we are having um, a quite equal representation of uh, answer one and answer two. So 38% have answered yes and 46% have answered no. So that's uh, that's a quite an interesting observation. And for sure, we will discuss uh, what are the outcomes of um, of these um, of these answers. Um, in the meantime, uh, we will give you just another couple of minutes to answer uh, the question. And um, I would like to uh, welcome um, on stage um, our first um, panelist, and uh, this is uh, Petra Hohendorn. She will uh, walk you through. Uh, just one slide, but a very, very crucial slide, uh, and she will present the opening, um, her opening remarks. So, Petra, um, you have the floor, and uh, please take it away. Yes, thank you, and thank you for inviting um, uh, all of us, I guess. Um, yes, my, my main point is there are great apps, and there are also crappy apps, and the difficulty is uh, distinguishing between the two. Uh, what you can see on the left corner is an example that I tend to use uh, a lot in my field of oncology. Uh, this was a, a randomized controlled trial, so really good research, so the, the gold standard in research, 766 patients, cancer patients with four different um, uh, uh, diagnosis in cancer, and if they use an app on a weekly basis to monitor their symptoms um, uh, with follow-up care from a nurse, uh, they lived five months longer with more quality of life and less hospitalizations. And the ones who had trouble with, had it, who didn't have enough, uh, a lot of computer skills, they even benefited more. So there are great apps. This is research from 2016, unfortunately, um, and for a number of these apps, they are not yet part of regular clinical care, or hey, there are, of course, also the uh, more lifestyle-related or wellness apps uh, that you could use yourself. So there's both part of clinical care and, and uh, as a consumer that you can use. Uh, but the trouble, as I mentioned, great apps, crappy apps, we do need something to recognize them. And I'd like to introduce the, the, the work that I've been involved in for the past two and a half years, 
the European Commission has asked uh, CEN, which is the European Standardization Organization, who joined ISO, uh, which I think uh, a lot of people probably know, the international standard organizations. And we made a new uh, standard, uh, which is called the technical specification um, for health and wellness apps, quality and reliability. And inspired by the very effective uh, EU energy label that I think uh, most people know, uh, and 93% of people in Europe know the energy label and 79% use them. Um, uh, it's had a very positive effect on quality, which is in this case energy consumption. We've learned from that and we've created a health app quality label that we hope in a few years will be uh, visible in the app stores, but also enable doctors uh, and other healthcare professionals to uh, give great recommendations uh, to patients and to make apps part of regular clinical care pathways and clinical guidelines and of care contracts. Uh, so there is still a lot of work to be done in that field. In Germany's front runner in this field, they're, they are reimbursing 20 health apps. We hope that in the next couple of years, um, uh, the, the benefits of, of e-health and in this case, uh, uh, health apps will be available to a lot of patients in a lot of different disease areas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Petra, for your opening um, remarks. And now um, I would kindly ask um, uh, Antanas to uh, very briefly uh, walk, us for, walk us through his um, initial uh, remarks. Um, Antanas, you have the floor. Well, hello, everyone. I feel really privileged to participate in this great panel and also to be a part of this amazing patient initiative, because I think and uh, as a junior doctor, I really hope that we'll have more and more cooperation in the future between, between doctors and, and, and patients, as this, in my opinion, the only way to go. And uh, before preparing the presentation, uh, this talk, I thought maybe, oh, we can discuss, you know, the the promising of the M Health and how how good it actually can be, because we have, as, as Petra said, the uh, multiple evidence showing that it has a particular role in chronic patient care, preventative care. There are evidence that it can improve health. However, uh, I will use this opportunity to highlight the potential problems that we need to overcome as a healthcare uh, professionals, or even we as the society in order to better implement these solutions. So uh, I will start with a simple fact, as simple as it, as it sounds, there's no digital health training for medical professionals in Europe. And uh, if you look to the surveys done by medical students or us talking with our colleagues from 22 European countries, we just learned that there are no proper uh, national-wide digital health training for medical doctors, both students and doctors in practice, to en enhance their knowledge and empower them to use these uh, technologies and, you know, to, to suggest the best... Um, best apps for their patients. The other problem we see is the fragmented standards. If you look to the Europe, uh, you know, and Europe wide, you will see that we have multiple countries that are quite advanced in digital, digital technology. They kind of have uh, good national digital health systems, but we still have countries or even regions within uh, one country that people don't get proper access to the digital technologies. There is also great inequalities in data protection and, and governance. And we believe that, you know, if we need to put great emphasis on, on data in general, we need to kind of protect the data of patients and we need to make sure that they trust us as, as healthcare providers, uh, you know, with, with their data. So I think this is also needs to be addressed in a more European kind of level. And the lack, uh, and the last, um, the last, I think the, the biggest strategic, strategic, uh, strategic uh, problem as we see is the, the way we deliver care. Because it's easy, you know, to discuss and to talk about the benefits of of M health of digital technologies, and I'm I'm really sure it's really helpful. But who is gonna pay for that, you know? And 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 how are we gonna that implement in our care? Because currently we have uh, we all appreciate that the way we deliver care is kind of more like budget orientated. So we have like up to 30, 40% of our healthcare costs are basically waste. And we don't invest that much 
and finding new ways how to deliver care. We rather invest a lot in technology. We have great breakthroughs uh, in terms of you know using artificial intelligence, using using fancy technologies, but we don't invest that much in actual healthcare delivery and actual. Uh, change of how we pay for healthcare systems, and we need if we need to kind of try find the ways how we pay for uh, focusing on outcomes of individual and population, and, and and if we would manage to change the way and use financing of healthcare as a tool for change, I think the digital health, especially M Health, and and using more apps and uh, patient oriented technology could serve as one of the cornerstones in that. However, if we you know will want to deliver fancy care in the old way, I think we might fail. So we, I'm looking forward to discuss uh, discuss with uh, the colleagues and uh, with the people in here. But I think we need to work together and be more more um, ambitious, not focusing on, more on technology, but in changing the system at large. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antanas. Uh, and last but not least, we have Angel. Um, please um, go ahead with your opening uh, remarks. Yeah, thank you, Lutmil. Um, yeah, and it's again also a pleasure for me to be joining the session today, also with a great co panelists. So I think we're going to be aligned on many things, but hopefully we're also going to be able to maybe um, uncover some issues which I think are really important. I mean, I, I, what I put here in my, in my opening remarks is that we believe that uh, M Health, as part of a digital health ecosystem, uh, has the potential actually, to empower people so that they have more ownership of their own health, right? And that also means that actually the, the care uh, they're going to receive is going to be much more personalized. Uh, in principle, actually, there are big opportunities, actually, for um, people and patients to have better access to the right information at the right time um, anywhere. So uh, we believe that's I mean, it's a huge uh, shift of paradigm in terms of how healthcare delivery is happening. Um, on the other hand, uh, we also see that it could potentially uh, enlarge the digital divide um, and, and actually the access to care that many people have. So it's really, really important that this comes uh, along the way with a, a, a fair approach uh, for people. The second thing is, I believe that M Health, uh, it's already showing, uh, particularly in the space of wellness, uh, but also beyond, um, that we're getting better insights. So patients and people are getting better insights about what's happening to their own health condition. Um, and as I said before, they can be better owners, but also it can help actually innovation and research. Uh, for example, in the use of this type of technologies in, the, in randomized uh, clinical trials. So. It's, uh, I think we think that's also very important and it could have potentially help us move towards something that many people have been talking for for years, which is value-based healthcare. Really healthcare that focuses where it makes an added value. Um, and finally, I would like to also highlight that overall, um, it has the potential also to improve the, the, the person's experience through their journey, right? So from... Uh, from uh, prior to a treatment, in the preparation of a treatment, for example, in surgery, uh, where there are many apps actually that today are supporting the patient basically to get ready and get fit for, um, for a surgery and actually scientifically proven that actually you get better outcomes after that surgery happens, but also what, for what happens uh, after surgery. And these patients are really more engaged. They can interact better with the healthcare professionals. So there is great potential. Um, we will get in a minute into the challenges, but I think one that I want just to point, I, uh, point out uh, at the moment is that at present, we have 350,000 apps in many different domains, um, but that's huge. And it's really, really important that we see how that can really have an impact across the board in the entire ecosystem. Um, but I will stop here because I'm pretty sure we're going to get into those challenges very soon. Thank you, thank you very much, Angel. Um, indeed, we will we will uh, we'll get into these challenges, and um, I see already a couple of questions in the chat. So that's amazing, uh, but one at a time. So first, um, let's just. Um, I would like to ask you the, a very simple question, and this is: Why do you think forty percent, close to forty-five percent, of um, the audience today at this session um, uh, hasn't used 
uh, any M health up. Uh, basically, this is what the polls showed in the very beginning. Why do you think that's that's uh, that's the that's the case? Um, yes, Antanas, go ahead. Oh uh, yeah. So for me, it it's both kind of a bit disappointing, but also kind of shows the reality because I think one of the key things is just. Uh, lack of integration you know i can use these apps but who i'm going to show it you know nobody cares basically because you know actually we don't have that many apps that kind of officially reimbursed they're kind of you know integrated into care and they we don't have pro there are some initiatives starting on in germany and uk where they starting to build their national kind of app stores that are kind of you know uh, officially approved and they've been trying to be integrated into care but you know, I think people don't see much value in these apps yet because, you know, uh, as, 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 as mentioned, there are 350,000 apps. So we need to make sure that how, man, how many of these can actually provide some benefits. And we still don't have proper ways to reimburse them and, we, and, and how, how are we going to pay for that care, you know, so and, and doctors as well. Are not prepared to to we we you know we can use the apps for to communicate with people, but we don't you integrate that many apps that actually kind of monitor patients' health and stuff. So who's gonna pay for that? You know, and 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 these are the I think high level questions. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Antanas, um, Petra, uh, and Angel. Would you like to um, also take this question and very briefly give your version of the story? Why do we have such a high percentage of people who haven't used M Health apps? Can I go? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, well, there was some very nice research from the EU uh, some time ago, which said, what do patients and carers need in health apps but are not getting? And some of the things that they said is the sheer number of health apps makes choosing them confusing. I'm not sure health apps will help me. I know of no health apps relevant to me. And I am suspicious of health apps because I don't know who makes them. And, uh, and and sort of this all leads to, I think, I prefer face-to-face -face consultations with my doctor and nurse. Um, and I think in the end, that is going to stay. And what we see in research as well is blended care is in the end the best thing. So using technology where you can, uh, but still have uh, see your, your doctor and nurse uh, uh, as well. Um, what we see in Dutch research is that one in three people um, reports having a health app, and it's mostly young people who are educated and e-health literate. Uh, so there is still uh, room for improvement, uh, definitely. On the other hand, I think we are also using health apps without being aware of it. Um, menstruation app, which a lot of uh, women use, it's a health app. Uh, a Nike uh, app, or I shouldn't say uh, probably a name, but uh, your running app is a health app. So health app is a very broad spectrum and, um, uh, and that we may be more engaged in than we think we are, but that we can definitely still progress in and, and use the, the, the power that is there, the benefit that is there. Absolutely, Petra. I do. I do agree with you. And I remember when we were building this session, we also spoke about lifestyle uh, applications and uh, basically what is the difference between the two. Um, Angel, um, you have the floor now, and then we will uh, go with our first question that we've uh, that you already started actually mentioning. But please uh, address this forty percent um, question. Yeah. Um... I think it's also interesting to have 38% who say yes. I think those numbers probably two, three years ago were much lower. And I think COVID-19 is really changing. I agree with Petra. I think we're going to move a bit more into a blended or hybrid model. Um, and I think that's also good news. I don't think we should go too fast either. Because also, also as I said, not everyone today will have either the knowledge or the ability to understand an app um, in the way that they deserve. Um, and on the other hand, uh, uh, yeah, we not everyone has also access to the technology per se. No? We were talking also recently in a meeting about the, the access to, to health uh, in rural areas. And digital health is very promising and health can be very promising, but do they have the infrastructure, the connectivity to make that happen? So I think 
I think we, we say several things here, which I'm in total agreement. I think the fragmentation, it's, it's key. It's confusing. It's difficult for, the, for people to understand what's relevant to me. I think, second, I believe not everyone will have today the infrastructure which is required. And I think this is important. We need to be also inclusive if we want to build that trust that Petra was referring to before. Um, and I also believe that also the, sometimes the design and, and, and sometimes companies may, we may, make mistakes when we design solutions if we are not thinking so the involvement of patients uh, for idea how much it changes engagement and adoption of those solutions compared to when we were not doing it so I think that's also very important is the engagement of the people in the design of those digital solutions. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Angel. I, I have seen your questions uh, and we will address uh, them as we speak. But before that, I would really like to set the scene a little bit to um, everyone on the panel and of course, everybody who's following us online. Um, I would like to talk a, a little bit about the challenges of um, what are the challenges uh, to the rapid development of digital technology in healthcare and specifically but also um, how this rapid development uh, digital um, rapid development of digital technology uh, will um, impact will influence um, the physical but also all in all care aspect of healthcare and specifically focusing on patient and healthcare professional relationship. So um, let's let's dive in a little bit into, into this um, quite, quite existential question uh, when it comes to the topic. And of course, then we'll address the questions that we have already received from the audience. I'm very, very pleased to see that, um, that we have a lot of interesting um, questions and we will address them. Um, so um, I would, of course, uh, go um, first to Petra, um, uh, who's wearing as almost everybody on the panel who's wearing several hats. So um, Petra, from the patient perspective, um, what do you think um, are the challenges and, and, and how can we overcome them? But also what's the, what's the impact and especially maybe looking into the last couple of years with, uh, uh, with the crisis? Yes, well, uh, I, I agree with uh, Angel that one of the things is uh, what we call in the label easy to use. So we're looking at four different aspects in the label, as you may have seen in these bars, uh, those colored bars on the label. Uh, is a health app healthy and safe? Is it easy to use? Uh, is my data secure? And is it robustly built? Does it work consistently over time? Um, and I think all of these elements are important and good that we know that we're aware of them, how good an app in itself is, but also the fact that, of course, do you have Wi-Fi connectivity or do you have a data plan? Uh, do you have the funds to pay for them? So inclusion is definitely um, one of the items that we need to look into. Not everybody has the right devices um, uh, on the other hand, we do have a lot and, and, and also um, in in. Uh, hard, what we tend to call hard to reach uh, population groups, there tend to be quite a lot who do have that connectivity, but we have to make sure that it's uh, it's there for everyone. Um, what I tend to say, so my, uh, you mentioned I'm a patient advocate. My husband was diagnosed with a brain tumor of which he died almost 10 years ago. And if I see those um, numbers of there are great health apps that can actually give you five more months with more quality of life uh, in this blended care uh, variant um, uh, uh, with less hospitalizations. And I always try to think of my late husband would have loved to have had five more months with more quality of life and less hospitalizations. Um, so I I think we need to have our eye on the what is possible and we do definitely need to give more information and we hope that the uh, the the label will provide more information and it's it's something that uh, moves beyond just having the supplier information but it's actually going to be an accredited app assessment organization looking at okay how is this app scoring in several different elements in healthy and safe in easy to use in secure data and in robust build and we hope that that will enhance the trust, which was already mentioned, that that's an important thing and that will benefit 
um, a, a lot of people having the impact uh, that it can have in, in several domains um, and not in the least bit for, for the patient. But we do need to be aware of what are the great apps, what are the crappy ones. We need to have that right information. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Petra. Um, Antanas, uh, the same question to you regarding the challenges, how we can overcome them. And as, as a healthcare professional, you, I, I'm sure that, uh, and you already started mentioning them, but I'm sure that the mHealth apps um, have an impact on the relationship between um, patients and healthcare providers. Yeah, so I think I, I have mentioned several challenges and maybe I'll come back to them uh, during my first intervention. But uh, starting from the point you mentioned about the ability to communicate with our patients, I'm not sure whether we can call them like, yeah, it's M health app, but it's more like communication tool because it's very hard like to maybe to talk about digital health in general because it has multiple, multiple layers, but maybe we can just focus on that if it's app, for example, so let's say it's even can help us to communicate with the patient. Yeah, it's telehealth, which we, we which we could discuss rather telehealth, and and we've seen that telehealth communicating with patients with digital um, devices uh, boomed during COVID nineteen. You know, because we, I remember before the the COVID came, you know. As a young, as junior doctors, we've been kind of pushing why we can't, you know, uh, use more digital consultations. Why we should still need to go to the hospital? And I remember the establishment or you know, kind of uh, other colleagues always saying, "Oh, it's not safe. How we can evaluate, you know, them?" them. So basically, it happened in one year time. We're using more technology that supposed to happen in 10 years time so we can you know we learn that we can go fast and implement uh, great things however i would say it's still kind of tool to communicate rather than intervene in patient health and we don't see that many interventions in um, apps that can basically be used as proper digital therapeutic so as a digital therapeutic so basically you use the app or technology to improve patients' health to intervene in their care. So we still not see that many of them. And uh, one of the reasons, as I mentioned before, like lack of standards, this, I think the Petra mentioned that properly and, 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 and covered that properly, that as we still don't have a labeling system. We still don't have like pan-European standards. What are the good apps? What are the wrong apps? And can you like imagine like healthcare physician or GP, for example, they will get... Uh, any kind of app from patients because there are 350,000 apps and patients can bring any kind of app to the to their office. So how can I trust that app? Do I need, you know, how can I, uh, how can I know that the, the data is correct? But I think there are more, more fundamental problems. I uh, will come back more on those fundamental problems because I think this is what comes from being in the field as a, a healthcare provider that again, we pay not much that much attention or enough attention to prevention. Like we focus on treating disease and intervene. So there was a survey done in my country, Lithuania. So up to 60% of patients still prefer surgical interventions and, 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 and drugs rather than pre getting preventive care. So for me, it's a bit shocking because I think the M health and digital therapeutics has the greatest potential if we focus and invest more on preventative care. Basically, we shift gear to, you know, to uh, to prevent diseases, and uh, and we still kind of uh, invest only like three five percent of our healthcare expenditures in this field, which is I think the most significant one. So we don't don't have like strategic investing. I think in general we kind of, as I mentioned, use uh, healthcare funding to pay for service rather than invest in healthcare. It invest in uh, in improving outcomes of patients. So if we will somehow manage how to Find finance healthcare in a way that we invest in patient care and we get better outcomes, then naturally we will tend to use more and more digital technology because it can prove uh, significant that can improve significantly the patient's health. So I think you know the the training again, like we still need to have medical workforce that are capable of and comfortable working with the with the digital technology, not kind of you know running away. Because and on the other hand, like we go in that direction that everything is digital. But if you look at the surveys and, and research in the US, you will see that 50% uh, of people who, who uh, suffer burnout in healthcare, as a healthcare workforce, they will say that 50% of them, they will say that 
crappy digital technologies is the main the main thing why they don't want to go to work because you know it's additional burden uh so there are multiple multiple complex things but i think uh, going the more strategic ones first you know uh, setting the right scene and proper incentives and proper financing systems we can we can we can we will definitely then find the ways how to implement good technology with the proper standards and just very last question uh, training not only for medical doctors, but digital literacy for patients as well. And I think you're going to cover that um, quite extensively during the whole the whole event. But yep. you know, but if people can't access that these apps, it means that it can increase inequalities even for healthcare. You know, because if poor part of population will be using proper apps, we will get you know care through technology, better care, and other part of population will not be able to, you know, to get to use these apps to how to communicate with them. We will just leave them, you know, in, 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 in worse, worse uh, clinical conditions. And Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Antanas, for your open and, 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 and rather honest uh, opinion and also um, for just making us closer to the perspective of, of, of your country. Um, finally, Angel, um, the same question regarding the challenges when it comes to the rapid development of digital technology in healthcare, um, and perhaps from uh, the standpoint of, of industry, um, you can also uh, talk about the impact uh, that this development uh, is having on the patient slash healthcare um, providers relationship as well. Um, and of course, options to overcome it. You've already started a little bit as well. So um, please go ahead. Yeah, not sure. And, and, it, and it's kind of difficult when I go after them to add something really <laughs> meaningful because they really bring all the good points. Um, but just maybe to, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to build on them actually. So I think I agree around the quality of the apps, but even with that, it's not enough, right? So what we see right now, um, there is a challenge also in getting all these apps, let's say, giving the 360 to the patient. So I mentioned before the word interoperability, which is very nice for those who are working in digital health, but sometimes it sounds really strange outside that world. Um, it's really important that the apps um, are able, let's say, to work with each other, right? So that in the end, uh, the patient is not confused by two, three different apps that are giving different chunks or silos of information about their own condition. Uh, but that's not really interconnected. This cannot be interconnected because the data is not interoperable because the solutions are not interoperable. And then they really face fragmented um, uh, from mental landscape, like we explained before. Um, so we believe that's important. As, as I said as well, I think it's important to engage patients from the beginning in ideation and conception of digital solutions when, whenever possible. It's not always possible, uh, but whenever possible, um, that should be the way because, again, we will be uh, better in trying to meet those needs. Um, and again, there will, there will be better ownership and actual engagement from patients in, in, the, in the management of those digital solutions. Um, I agree on the literacy point. And what I will add is, but we also need health literacy for, um, for computer scientists, for uh, programmers, for coders, for data scientists, because this is really, we need to make this society somehow bilingual. Um, and it goes both ends, right? Because sometimes it's not healthcare professional developing these apps, right? So we need to have, uh, let's say, a, an ecosystem actually that works better together. Um, and the last part I would like to, to address, um, and I know it's really, uh, it's, been, it's been already mentioned, but I think it's also important that we, also get a bit more consistent in the way we govern data. There is no doubt that any of these apps uh, should respect privacy by design, GDPR, obviously um, as, the, as a starting point, I would even say. But then what we find is it's a fragmented approach in the way GDPR is interpreted and implemented, which is confusing for everyone, not only for industry, for academics, for hospitals, for patients themselves. So we need to be more consistent within the European Union in the way we, we, we apply GDPR. And, uh, but, but not only that, I would say in general, at least to build a data culture. And I think in that respect, maybe Finland is still one of those um, best practices that we like to see because they're able actually to respect privacy, but still 
give clear visibility to people and predictability on how the data is going to be managed, who is involved in using their data or not, et cetera. So the system seems to be much better. And therefore, actually, what you find always in the in the Eurobarometer is actually that they're really more um, prone to use digital apps compared to other European countries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angel. Uh, I think that uh, your building up and your contribution was uh, also um, equally amazing. So um, I see that we are um, uh, running into uh, our last 20 minutes of the session. So um, I will now address some of the questions uh, that have been um, put by our amazing audience. Um, so the first one um, it is, what makes a great or high quality app? And there are two two sub questions. So the first one is, um, are the criteria of what makes a great or high quality app linked to insurance reimbursements? And also which apps keep users engaged? So some of you already to uh, talked about, Antanas talked about the reimbursement, um, but also I think Petra, um, as she was part of uh, two, uh, of two apps that she has um, um, developed or contributed to develop um, in oncology, um, I think perhaps Antanas could uh, answer the first uh, the first uh, sub question, and then we'll go to Petra uh, with the second one. So basically, the first so the overall question is what makes a great or high quality app, um, and then the criteria um, are they linked to insurance reimbursements, and also which apps keeps users engaged. So perhaps Antanas, would you like to start? Yeah, so this is quite a challenging question, I think, because <laughs> the <laughs> what is the good app? You know, if I would know, I'm, maybe I would be the owner of one. <laughs> I'm kidding, but uh, um, I think it depends on what you want to achieve. And uh, we, I think we still have successful apps in terms of spread that are focused more on... Uh, wellness and i think we still have more and more like wellness apps you know that's you know sporting sport apps as as, as petra mentioned like those conditions like the for menstruation apps you know all these kind of wellness apps that that proved you know to be really successful i think in my opinion but um in terms of like clinical care in in more like um uh, like uh, other conditions like oncology and and, 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 and and chronic care, I think the successful apps needs to we can use for example like diabetes for example. So in this in, in, in this uh, field the successful app would be the one that helps patients to better you know maintain their sugar levels and you know and, and for a longer time to to improve their outcomes for example. So I think this is the only way how you evaluate them. Of course, they need to be like safe. You need to have all these kind of uh, the technical aspects and all the data protection aspects covered. But this is, you know, this is mandatory to do. But I think in, in general, for as a healthcare professional, the good app is just helps me to achieve better outcomes of patient. And, 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 and we don't still not have many of them. Yeah, that is unfortunate indeed. And regarding diabetes, you're absolutely right. If you open the app store, there are, there are hundreds, thousands of um, self-management apps for diabetes. But indeed, uh, what we discussed already for the previous 40 minutes, it's all applicable for these apps. Um, Petra, uh, perhaps you can just um, uh, answer the question on what apps keeps users engaged. And of course, then we'll go to um, Angel um, and you feel free to answer um, either of the questions. So Petra? Yeah, I'm going to be a bit naughty because I, I'm <laughs> going to be uh, uh, <laughs> covering as well what makes a great app. So if we look at the standard, we, uh, we're looking at four different elements and I completely agree with Antonas. It starts with, it when it comes to a health app, you need health benefits. So we're on the label, you can see what's the health benefit. And then it looks at this healthy and safe, easy to use, secure data and robust build and 67 requirements underneath it. So there's a lot of different aspects to it. And it depends a bit on the type of app. If it's a monitoring app, some things matter more than others. If it's just a communication app or uh, uh, it's a completely different thing. Um, but there are also apps that can help with diagnosis or with treatment or so it depends on what you're talking about. And I'm actually working with the European Society of Cardiology to see whether we can make profiles of what is a great monitoring app, a great 
communication app, etc. Uh, early stages. Um, and we are working with in the Netherlands with the Dutch insurers to use this as a starting point for reimbursement. But that's still a long way to go. If you look in Europe, um, there's a lot of advocacy needed there. So I think uh, EPF can uh, contribute there too. Um, which apps keep people engaged? I don't have a list uh, uh, easily uh, available. Uh, what you do see is um, uh, apps are not there that long. And, and I think a lot of the gaming industry is very, very good at uh, what apps keep you uh, engaged. If I look at my youngest son, I, I, I would hope that they would give, <laughs> keep him less engaged. But uh, um, uh, there... Uh, Gaming is a part of an element, but I think in the end, if you can see that there's benefits coming from and that there's good co co uh, combination in working with your healthcare professional, uh, then that is likely to give to keep you engaged. And and for the apps that uh, for one of the apps that I uh, initiated, we saw that 100% of the people recommended it to other patients, and 90% uh, finished it. And uh, and I see more. Uh, apps that ha that are giving these kind of numbers. And if you look at the 350,000, of course, yes, there are great apps and yes, there are crappy apps. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Uh, Angel? Yeah, no, I think well, I kind of mentioned before that um, I think it all starts by defining well uh, the need. I think sometimes an app is developed and then is pushed basically for use. As opposed to really spend enough time really in saying what that really what is really the problem we're trying to solve and what's really the need that we're trying to meet. Um, and sometimes not not enough time is spent there. There are many assumptions which are being made are, along the way. I think the second one is really um iteration. I think that's again from 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 the industry actually, which is already yeah, games and, and other. Uh, which are really, really well advanced in the in yeah in the whole notion of uh, app developments and software development, they really have very strong concept of iteration. So you need to keep improving your apps because uh, you you may get maybe the the right concept at the beginning, but it still probably needs improvement here and there. Sometimes that's also maybe something that is not always uh, pursued. And and then I think finally it's it needs to be user friendly. I mean, it's the gaming point. It, it, it shouldn't be over demanding from the user compared to what is given to the user. I think that's that's it's in the essence, but sometimes we don't realize that actually, but in healthcare, in finance, in many different sectors, these apps tend to be quite demanding on the user side. And then that, that balance needs to be well stricken there. Absolutely. Perhaps yes. if I can add a, a few more things, what we're looking into and easy to use in that have one of those four aspects are indeed things like what are the goals, what are what is the context of uh, of use, and doing that with the people who are actually going to use it, have them involved in developing it, have them test whether it works well, making sure that it's accessible, also for people who have trouble hearing, seeing, uh, motor functions, uh, lower level education, how can they still understand it? So those are all kinds of questions that, of course, contribute. If it's easier to use, that, of course, contributes as well uh, uh, to being engaged. Do, is, is there a clear way to go about it? Uh, instructions for use. Can you call somebody if you're stuck? Uh, is it age appropriate? These are all the types of questions that we have in this easy to use, which are supposed to also give more guidance to manufacturers saying, okay, if you can tick all these boxes uh, uh, to a level that we, we agree that that is uh, enough and, and sufficient and works, uh, then that, of course, uh, helps to further improve those um, engagement levels. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, over the day, we've already heard the concept of trust and, of course, the concept of co-design. I think these two concepts are quite crucial when it comes um, to the reliability of the app, but also to the engagement of the app. So um, definitely when it comes to trust um, uh, from the patient standpoint, it is absolutely a must uh, for the patients to know uh, that they can trust the app, uh, to know how the app was developed. 
uh, and also um, we always advocate for for co-design and co-development basically involving patients um, in the development of of these applications i see another questions when it comes to apps and um, this one is are there applic apps that can detect rather than manage disorders um, so we started from more the general perspective of uh, communication and then uh, we also move to a little bit to self-management and now we have a question a question from the audience uh, which is basically about um, are these apps can detect um, rather than manage uh, disorders perhaps you can share uh, your experience or 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 if you know um, any sorts of uh, such apps yeah, well, perhaps uh, what is nice to hear is uh, I, I showed an example in oncology. There was a similar example in Europe um, where they were monitoring uh, or asking patients to monitor their symptoms. And the number of uh, times progression of, in this case, lung cancer was detected in between hospital visits uh, went up from 34% to 74%. So tremendous lot more that was detected just by uh, making sure that you you track um, if people have, uh, you have people tell themselves whether they have symptoms and if there is an increase then in nurse calls and it helps because often, even though doctors say do call if there is something, they tend to wait or they think, oh, this is part of the disease or I have an appointment in a few weeks. Uh, and this here, it turned out that this tremendously works. And of course, there are other things like um, skin cancer, which is dependent on how good is the algorithm. But uh, that, again, is, a, is an example of a diagnostic uh, uh, app. Uh, the intention is to, to detect certain things. So within the standard, we have a lot of different uh, intended uses. So it ranges from uh, having it uh, used for your communication, having information, uh, behavior change, um, self-management, uh, monitoring, uh, uh, treatment, uh, 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 yeah, a lot of diagnostic uh, things, calculating things. So there are a lot of possibilities. And I think, uh, as Antana said already, within COVID, we've seen that there is a lot of potential um, that we can still use and that we can still learn in as well. Thank you very much, Petra. Antanas, uh, Angel, any, anything yeah, to add on this just, question? Just, yeah. just a brief, uh, there are several, but maybe first, I think it's important to understand that it's also still, and I think for a long time, it's going to still be a, only a tool for the, you know, the diagnostic in general, the condition is like very comprehensive and complex thing. Yeah. So it can definitely play a huge role for us helping to identify the potential, you know, symptoms and potential uh, conditions that needs to be like diagnosed with, you know, proper and, and, and more further examination. However, there are examples, I think more in like research mode, but what I know that there is an app that listens to your voice and it can kind of basically find some conditions with your throat, for example, because your your voice changes. There is also an app, um, it's rather intrusive, but you can use it uh, and it monitors your texting, your behavior and social media, and they can identify your mental problems, whether how you communicate, what kind of, uh, uh, it's quite still under research. But as, as Petra said, there are multiple apps that can play a huge role in, 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 targeting someone to identifying someone that needs further examination but i think uh, it's still a long time long long way to go like to have only one app you know the perfect chatbot that can you know when you answer all the questions that it gives you that diagnosis i know that there's been an initiative to find and create uh, these things but i'm rather more optimistic that we will still have more human interface and and, and we'll use them you know just as a complementary rather than supplementary yeah Thank you. And Angel? I totally agree. Maybe also uh, we have some experience in my company also with um, apps which are able to help you predict or detect cardiovascular diseases. So we believe there's also a very promising area over there. Um, I think when it comes to treatment, I agree with Antanas, maybe it's maybe still far, but there seems to be quite a lot of potential also mental health. 
Um, so that will be interesting, but I totally agree. I think this is still needs to be, well, I mean, the, the role, and by the way, I, I, I'm conscious I didn't really totally answer your question before. Let me, I think the role of the healthcare professional is key. Um, in, in not only because of understanding or because of the impact this app could have, but also actually because it can optimize uh, what this app could potentially do also for the patient and to improve patient outcomes. So I believe that's still really, really important. And all that needs to be well understood because as uh, Antana has explained very well, we still need to go through um, a societal and a cultural change here on all fronts. So yeah, so not, not a small challenge to overcome. Yeah. That's a fantastic. That's a fantastic point indeed. I realize that we are uh, having only nine minutes left, but uh, before we before we close, there is a Antanas for you. There is a follow up question, basically very briefly, and then we'll go from uh, we'll go to one um, take home message uh, from each perspective. But for Antanas, could apps which are not recognized as medical devices be accepted by medical professionals uh, uh, professionals as part of um, health procedures because Sometimes we hear from clinicians, they cannot use the app's uh, data as they're not recognized as medical devices. So perhaps this very briefly, if you, if you have experienced this, you already mentioned a few elements. Uh, so I think this is, again, a, a bit tricky question because I think in general, we are able to use only approved things. So yeah. <laughs> if you, if you want to use anything, like even uh, algorithms for ideology, for example, we kind of there is a also a busy field with lots of AI companies trying to change you know to to replace us <laughs> as a physician but I'm kidding but the, in general uh, it's uh, it still needs to be approved one way or another it, there are multiple apps I think they go under wellness apps and but they're gonna be still that they will have limited clinical kind of impact in my opinion I'm not very kind of as you can understand, we're still not using many, many apps in our daily practice. But I think uh, if you want to have like app that but, which uh, tries to directly intervene in someone's care, it needs to be approved by uh, by by uh, you know some some authorities. agencies, authorities. So yeah. I think um, th there's no way to overcome. I hope, I really hope, there's no way to overcome the <laughs> the, the, the the system. All right. Thank you very much. As um, we have said, maybe, sorry, yes, bit, yes, go ahead. Very quickly. No, but just very quickly, because that's also the space in which we work in MedTech Europe. Um, and I believe there's still, um, there is right now very clear many apps which are used in healthcare settings, which don't need to be classified as a medical device. It's mostly for healthcare management. Um, but you could also include even some uh, patient pathway uh, tools and apps, which do not diagnose which do not treat therefore they only support as a platform as software for the interaction between the healthcare professional and the patient so that the healthcare professional can have access to the data also uh, more timely however i believe and i agree with Antanas, i think we need to build that trust um, and we need to somehow overcome that because the lines are going to be very blurred and it's going to be increasingly blurred between wellness uh, wellness apps and the ones that we're using in healthcare settings. And I think those lines are going to be blurred because in the end, we also want to learn more about the lifestyle condition if we want to treat effectively the patient, right? So I think that's that's maybe a, also another important uh, maybe debate that you might want to address uh, in the future uh, in EPA. Absolutely, absolutely. I can I can um, add a bit uh, yeah. uh, to it. Uh, in, in the Netherlands, research has been done how many apps are medical devices. And there was a sample of 271 apps and one in five was a medical device. So four in five are not. And they actually also looked at which field is it in. And for example, there were 34 were in the cardiac system, 20 were medical devices. There were five in cancer. None of them were a medical device. Uh, diabetes, 19 apps were in there and only five were a medical device. So even if it is a medical condition, it doesn't mean that it's a medical device. Um, 
And even if you try to treat it as such, you're actually breaking the law. So we yeah. need to be aware that that okay. it's only one in five, but the others may be equally interesting. And if you look at the financial perspective as well, uh, a side effect uh, of a number of those apps would be that it makes um, healthcare somewhat cheaper. It is net, not going to replace the doctor that I completely uh, uh, agree with, but there are elements where you can uh, benefit and, and also um, yeah, help the fact that there's a shortage of health professionals, which is going to increase over time even more. Um, and and then I th I think there's there's still a lot of uh, potential that we should look at. Uh, so if you look at the financial perspective, it said that about sixty percent is in wellness in prevention, about thirty five percent or something was in monitoring. So those are the big ones where we can really make. Um, yeah, we can benefit uh, both in health and in costs uh, as a side effect, which is uh, nice as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are five minutes into um, before the end of our session. So I would like you now to give one take home message uh, to the audience. Uh, this time we'll start from uh, Angel, then Antanas, and then we'll uh, finish with uh, the patient perspective and Petra. So Angel, uh, one key message, one take-home message for the audience. Well, listen, maybe something that we didn't really maybe mention explicitly, or we have mentioned it, but maybe very quickly, but I believe it's actually, it has come, it has come implicit in our conversation is that precisely digital health um, and men health, it needs to be integrated into an ecosystem and the ecosystem requires collaboration, cooperation. You have seen mostly from my co-panelists, very bright ideas, very good at points. And they actually, when we put all of them together, actually, it's showing us the, the, the pathway, right? The journey that we need to, to, to continue. So to me, collaboration in that ecosystem is going to be a key, key aspect. Thank you. Thank you too. Antonas? Yeah, so I could not agree more with the, with the Achille. Uh And I think uh, this is the future. It's inevitable. One way or another, we will be using these apps. To, you know, I, I would prefer that we would have a more systematic approach, more comprehensive approach, and to change the, and use these tools and, and this kind of um, technologies to change the system for good rather than adapt them for broken systems. So I think, and for that, we need to do the collaboration all together. Patients, as well. they need to be in the center for for this. And 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 I really hoping that that we will witness it the the proper proper transformation during our lifetime. Hopefully, yes, indeed, Petra. Yeah, I can only agree as well that uh, it, it, it's about being implemented uh, um, and, and being a, a regular intervention alongside other health invention, interventions that are already there. So I, as we are today at the European Patient Forum, uh, I would like to stress the, the possibilities of advocacy from patients uh, to make it part of care pathways, of clinical guidelines, of care contracts, uh, and make it regular, make it something that you can benefit uh, uh, from. Um, and I'm very interested in Catalonia, for example, in that uh, way they are going to build, um, firstly, uh, so it seems uh, a care pathway for diabetes, for all the diabetes patients uh, there, where they're looking at, okay, how can we, optimize the use of digital in the whole care pathway. And I'm, I'm really interested in what that's going to deliver. And they have a few more um, uh, waiting next uh, after diabetes, but please use your advocacy uh, because it can benefit you. And as I mentioned, my late husband would have loved to have had five more months with more quality of life and less hospitalizations. So make yourself heard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much as, as, as panelists and speakers. It has been absolutely a pleasure for me and I hope for our audience. Thanks so much to the audience as well. I think that today we, we, we learned a lot and for sure as EPF we will continue our advocacy work. Uh, please um, stay with us until the end of today and of course enjoy the rest of the um, of the program and Congress. And now I leave you uh, to Yvette and Tasha. And thank you once again. Um, it was absolutely a pleasure for me. And um, we'll keep in touch. Bye-bye.